it's your turn. What's the best thing about Adepticon? Well, many things, and if you attended the convention, you. But not everybody gets to attend this convention, and it has a lot of impact on the gaming community. There are a lot of reveals that happen from major companies, and to cover all of Adepticon, eh, I was pretty busy, and there's a lot to see. It would just turn into a list, so I wanted to zoom in on something really unique that was revealed to me. In my foot travels across Adepticon, I eventually found my way to the grimdark hallway. Uh, last year I couldn't find it, it's a very elusive area, but rest assured, ask anyone with a black denim jacket and they will definitely know where the grimdark area is. So I found it early on Wednesday and things were getting set up. It was uh, really good to catch up with people you don't know. <laughs> there's, there's so many uh, people, people there whose, whose work I admire. I don't know them that well, but following their work, I already like them. So it was, it was good to see some of those familiar faces that only come through on conventions or maybe pop up online. But I want to say this area really spoke to me. It was just, it was so inspired. And I think why it, why it really connected with me and why a lot of people in that community have made it what it is is because it captures a very strong DIY element. Um, when I was younger, I went to a lot of basement shows and had the, the patchy jacket and stuff and still do. But something about those shows is a lot of your performances are for an audience made up of also other band members, of also other creators and individuals who are contributing to this this very unique scene. And so that's what I saw in the Grimdark area. You have um, a lot of self-made games and this level of camaraderie that you would seem as clicky, but it's very open to the public. I'm just a new guy walking in there. So yeah, it was just really nice to observe the, the passion, the creativity, and the stylish, uh, stylish edge really spoke to me. So I made my way around and introduced myself. I made sure to ask everyone for permission to be filming and, re and recording their work. So thank you everybody for, for agreeing to that. Um, yeah, as you can see here, I got in and saw this amazing Mordheim table and God, just through all this, it was really cool. Like I didn't have a lot of social time. I was, I was pretty busy. It was, it was just uh, different. It was, it was a very fun weekend. But just overhearing the way that people were playing their games, it was a very communicative experience. It reminded me of playing Infinity, where you're declaring your intentions, but then in some cases, you wouldn't know exactly what the rules outcome for the intentions would be. You're, you're talking with your, your opponent or the game master, saying like, okay, I'm walking across this, this catwalk, or we're playing falling with falling damage. Let's roll a d20 and see if somebody breaks their legs. It was, uh, it was really cool to see. And much like any underground movement, on the face of it, it may seem all identical, just clad in black. But a keen observer and someone who learns to speak the language will learn there's a very deep distance. Let's look at a couple of games, for example. On one hand, you have D-Beat. In the form of Mech 28, and it's simple, predictable, uh... Simplicity, yet straightforward nature that just keeps hitting and bringing you back for more. It gives you everything you came for and doesn't waste your time with anything else. Not to say that Cauldron would be a waste of time. This represents more of the long form, deeper detailed format such as Dungeon Synth. It doesn't quite apply. This is a very stylish and beautiful book, but I wanted to say the words Dungeon Synth for all the people from that community watching this. And one of the especially cool things in the Grimdark area, they have their own merch. It's great. I, I liked all the, the t-shirts. I picked up one that was designed by Martin McCoy, very, very powerful artist in that area. But also on that table, there was this stack of these plain cardboard boxes. And you can, you can uh, pay $10 and you choose a random one of these boxes. Inside, you receive a sculpt from Gardens of Hecate. That's an artist that I've I've really admired for a long time. I think um, in in this area of the hobby, talent uh, expression is what comes across. That's the most powerful element. It takes talent to 
to create your expressions, but it is, is a different form beyond the technical level that, that I might see myself in the Golden Demon competition. I also greatly admire working in this way and a lot of it, you know, is its roots are connected to John Blanche's artwork. It's paying homage to that, so I love it. And I picked up one of these these random grab models. I did not receive a special golden bar inside of the package, which would have rewarded me with a painted model. But luckily I have my own paint and I will paint my own model. So let's talk about that. Given my mighty man from Gardens of Hakate and knowing that individual expression, as in the customized battle vest, is key to every single unit in your force, I had to modify this model. What I was given originally was a, a mace and a buckler, and I saw it fit to cut the hand away from the buckler and make that into a very stooped helmet and uh, pull out a, a kite shield so I could put a nice strong symbol on top of that. I'll try to keep this part quick and simple, but as a big fan of John Blanche, I'll be choosing colors that you'd see in one of his paintings. This also gives me a chance to showcase some of the upcoming effects line from the Army Painter to this specific crowd of people. I'll be using some of the rust effects as well as some ooze. But before I can get to those after effects, I needed some base coats. I needed a revolting orange for that proper blanche tone, so I mixed molten lava and carnelian skin together, painting half of the figure. The opposite side will be based in Great Hall Gray. And there's a specific uh, choice here. I'm choosing to place the darker portion, the deep orange, behind a lighter portion. It'll be sandwiched in between that Great Hall Gray and as well as the shield being in a lighter color, taking the form of necrotic flesh. Painting right along, it's time for the base. I took a wet blend of mainly tundra top. I laid down a very heavy amount of that and then brought a little bit of black into it, mixing it together right on the base, producing you know a little bit of a deeper gradation towards the back. Then to pick out the stones, I picked the already available Great Hall Gray. Now this may not be proper stepping for a tutorial, but it's the way I work. I have wet paint on a model, so I'm going to jump over to a different area. While the base was still wet, necrotic flesh and tundra top were brought into play. Just wet blending those together. My aim was to create a messy linear texture, so I just pushed the paint around trying to locate the tundra top towards the bottom and the necrotic flesh towards the top, painting in vertical stripes, losing half of it, just mixing the paint around. Wet blending is easy, wet blending is fun. And it's also drying, so I'll jump back to the base, dry brushing necrotic flesh over all of those slight textures. Real quick, the metals were hit with a coat of gun metal, and the gloves were based in black and textured, pressing some Great Hall Gray into them, trying to maintain a very limited palette, but just press away and create some ruddy leather textures. To apply some proper damage to the armor, I took a shred of sponge and a little bit of diluted black and just stippled it all over the model. Some areas I'd need to take a brush and fit some, uh, some chipping in where the sponge wouldn't fit. After that was dry, I gave it uh, an overbrushing of gunmetal, but I made sure it's, it's a, the brush is in a dry brush state, but I'm using downward strokes to just catch the upper edges of everything, and that because that's where the paint would be worn off, chipped away, exposing some of that armor underneath. Now I needed a bold symbol to go onto the, the shield, and I like capturing the whole kind of macabre, unreality, world gone insane, past its prime, we're all about to die, but some are alive because the sun is gone, but no plants grow, we live on alcohol, who knows, I haven't seen the sun, so I wouldn't know if it exists. You know, that kind of uh, narrative. So the psychic cross seemed appropriate, and also as a nod to my friends in that community, some of you are probably familiar and fans of the album Metal Circus by Husker Du, featuring a psychic cross on the cover. It's a good one. But I want to add that I didn't want the design to be too heavy. Painting it on in straight black would just be a little too deep. I, I want a lighter painterly touch, so mixing black with tundra top again just to produce, produce a little bit of a lighter shade of whatever color I made. 
all dressed up and ready for the dance. It was time for a little anti xenophil Sorry, I have to do the monster truck voice every time I name that term, but a unifying spray was applied, combining magnolia brown in my airbrush and black, and just gently applying the shadows until I was satisfied. God, look at it. That's such a fun step in the process. At this point, with the damage done, I pulled out my speed paint medium and some desolate brown and thinned it down very far. Speed paint has been taking the place of inks for me lately, and having some of the medium dilutes it down in a very controllable way, so I didn't want quite the heaviness that pure ink out of the bottle would grant me, but a diluted coat of desolate brown. I would say this is about 20% speed paint to the speed paint medium, but that was laid all over the entire model, tip to tip. Fun part over, now it's time for the fun part. In rust we trust, as they say. Fresh rust and dark rust from the army painter were applied. I'm playing around with it. Um, I find placing clumps and then adding water to spread it out gives it some natural variation and sink. And of course, working in layers to properly build. I really like these rust effects. They carry texture with them. They become a little bit different when stretched out and diluted. They're really doing it for me and I get a little better every time that I have a chance to use them. And now onto the base. I had a choice to make. In the grim dark world, everything is either dust or sludge. I chose sludge. I wanted to put some of this oozing vomit to the test. This is my very first time using this. And I can say I'm very happy with the results. It's a stringy material, but you can apply it in thick globs very easily, and it's just perfect for scummy puddles or weeping sores. Perfect. Now, it's looking nice. But the entire time that I've been staring at this model, there has been a small idea tickling in the back of my brain. After all, the individual touch and personality is key, unifying the bond between the artist and the artisan. I am given a canvas, and what can I do with it? So, like a true blood-sucking freak, I began drilling into the top of the head. First of all, boring a small pilot hole with my X-Acto blade, and then putting the drill to it. And then I had the perfect material lying around. I do not know the exact source for this. It was mailed to me by a friend, but these lovely fake pine tree fronds. Maybe someone in the comments could help out and enlighten me, but it makes a very nice tiny little feather. So I just dropped that in, gave it a quick overbrushing of Great Hall Gray, and then giving it a coating again, just like the rest of the model of desolate brown. And there it is, my impained warrior stands strong in his suit of armor. And check it out, he also has a tiny little friend. The box uh, came with, I think this was intended to be the head, but to me it looked like the fish from the Simpsons in a grimdark way, so there's Blinky everybody. I had an absolute blast painting this up. It's, it's always, it's enjoyable for me to work at different levels with different targets in mind. Everything, every piece for me is an experiment. And while I won silver in the Golden Demon, gold in the Resin Beast, gold in the Worthy, and gold in P3, I came home and what I was most inspired to do was make this. Because it has character and personality, and it connects me to the past. As the older I get, the more I look back on those those days of fondness, you know, combining those, those kind of, uh, we'll call it salad days of the underground punk community, as well as the era of design that, that first pulled me in. Pewter models, old lead casts. I, I got involved in this at a very early age, thanks to my oldest brother. And having a copy of Mordheim in my hands, and it was fresh, but I was very young, I now see how much, important, how much importance there is on that. You know, it's just, uh, I look back with a fondness at that era of design, and I'm glad that it's still alive. So thank you for watching this video. Please consider supporting me on Patreon if you're not already. You can see the, this video ad-free, many other tutorials, over 150. I'm always adding blog posts and keeping people updated, really trying to stay connected on there. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the like and subscribe. And always remember to remain unchained.